is where caregivers can thrive. Leslie, thanks for being here tonight. Thank also with you. us is Dr. Mark Melnick. Uh, Mark is the Director of Economic and Public Policy Research at the UMass Donahue Institute. He specializes in demographic, socioeconomic, and labor market issues, and he leads a 15-person team working on economic and public policy research projects that inform clients in government, private industry, and nonprofit sectors. Mark, it's great to have you. And rounding off our panel tonight is Lauren Jones. Uh, she's the Executive Vice President of the Massachusetts Business Roundtable. That's a public policy organization um, comprised of executives from some of the state's largest employers. And as part of her portfolio, Lauren leads workforce development policy and strategy for the roundtable. Lauren, Mark, Leslie, welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for being here tonight. I thought we would set up the discussion by uh, sharing a little bit of our reporting on what we've been calling the big quit. Uh, we've been chronicling the stories of people from all walks of life who've made major changes during the pandemic. Uh, there are the real people behind these record setting quit rates you've heard about. And GBH News senior producer Emily Judum has put together this short video so you can get a sense of how this pandemic has changed people's priorities and expectations. It has been two years since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. People just wanted to blow up everything that wasn't working. Make sure you practice social distancing. They wanted to quit their spouses. They wanted to quit their city. They wanted to quit their job. I was definitely like burning out. I was tearing myself apart with my own schedule. I didn't want a job where I was sitting in front of a computer. We don't want to go back to trying to succeed in a system that wasn't really rigged for our success. I felt such trepidation about going back to the same routine I had been in pre-pandemic, and I thought, no, I'm not going back. <laughs> the gift of time and self-reflection has enabled me to make a really significant change in my life. I'm relying on myself here. I'm not getting my weekly check. I didn't have a choice but to leave my job because I had no childcare for my daughter. I got one of the last rental cars and came back to Cape Cod and it sort of started percolating this idea of like, oh, I don't think I want to live in New York anymore. I sat down and said, what am I really going to do in retirement? I thought, you know, I'm either going to wake up and I'm going to be 80 years old and think, wow, I should have done that or I'm just going to go do it. Seeing your business, something that you made, your brand, on paper, it's like surreal. Yes, 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 yes. All right, ready? Going through this pandemic and really these awful times has really pushed me to truly understand that life really is too short and you have to do what you love. I want to go back to school to become a software engineer. I really actually decided to go and start studying for law school back in March. Every bone rolling through. The old systems are clearly not working. So if we're gonna rebuild it anyway, now's our chance to kind of rise from the ashes. And by the way, some of those people you just met in the video are in our audience with us tonight. We thank them for being here and we invite you to stick around and meet them after our panel discussion. Um, also, we have heard from people all across the region who have written in or called about their big quits. If you're one of those people and you're in our audience tonight, feel free to drop us a comment or a question in the Q&A and let us know uh, that you have uh, shared your big quit. We'd love to acknowledge you. But let's talk about what's next. Offices are reopening. Traffic is coming back you know, from Amazon to Starbucks to neighborhood grocery store, service workers are unionizing, help wanted signs are everywhere. Uh, Mark Melnick, I wonder if we can start with you because I know you've been tracking the numbers, you've been looking at the job openings versus the number of jobs that are being filled. And I wonder if you can tell us what you're seeing and what this may mean for workers and workplaces. Sure, absolutely. So first, thanks for having me this evening. This was a really exciting topic to get to, to discuss with you all. And, you know, one of the things that's 
one of the things that I do as part of my work at the Donahue Institute is uh, we talk a lot about the different economic issues that are taking place in Massachusetts. And I'll go out uh, usually once a month or a couple times a month and do what we call the road show. And in January, February, March of 2020, I joked with my staff, but the road show was getting boring. And, uh, and be, be careful what you wish for, because the economic conditions changed so dramatically over the next couple of years. And Stephanie, your setup was wonderful with that when you start talking about not just the big quit, but then also these other issues that we're seeing in terms of unionization and other elements of, uh, of just the ways in which the economy is changing so dramatically. And so when we think about, uh, and I, I know we'll have plenty of time to talk about different issues in the next hour, but when we talk about the big quit, um, one of the things that we saw very dramatically over the course of particularly 2021 was this uh, spike in the number of workers who were disconnecting from their jobs. It was actually the highest quit rate, uh, both nationally and in Massachusetts, in recorded history. Uh, and, and so this is where we got a lot of energy around this notion of people, uh, you know, the, the great resignation or quitting or however we refer to it. What's been telling about it, though, has been the degree to which we've seen uh, worker empowerment in this. And I think one of the things that's been misstated a little bit when we think about the big quit isn't so much that people are permanently leaving the labor force. And in fact, at a, a, a talk I gave on Friday, it said it wasn't so much that uh, people don't want to work. It's that I don't want to work for you. And that, and that uh, workers were deciding that, hey, especially as the economy picked back up, there was the opportunity for workers to, um, you know, go and find opportunities that have more flexibility, higher pay. Um, so I think the degree of free agency that we're seeing from workers is both the combination of the things that you were seeing in the video about folks saying, reevaluating their relationship to work uh, and thinking like, well, are these hours quite right for me? Is this a passion for me? But then this other part, which is that, employers are saying employees are saying these conditions aren't flexible enough for me or the wages aren't high enough we've seen wages go up for workers uh, and in particular uh, the big quit has been most um, acute in those industries that are lowest pay so we're seeing a lot of uh, flex a lot of free agency among workers in low wage sectors and i think just kind of highlighting the fact that in tight labor market conditions and that's what we're in uh, workers have a certain level of power now that they didn't have necessarily before. Now, I could speak a little bit more as we go on through the evening about why I think that empowerment may be sticky, uh, in part because of just changing demographics in Massachusetts and the nation in general. Uh, but I think, you know, when we think about the big quid, there's two big things happening there. There's the cultural part about thinking about work, but then there's also just the basic economics of, uh, with less workers and uh, it, or that as employers were trying to fill more roles, uh, workers had some level of agency in order to be selective. And we've seen it uh, translate in both people changing jobs, but wages going up. And when you say wages going up, are you talking about service workers? Because that that's a, a lot of the big quit was in, in the industries where service workers uh, had been employed and decided they didn't want to be anymore. And that's the industries where we're seeing the unionization. So we, are we seeing a wage growth there, Mark, real quickly? And then I'll jump over to Lauren. Yeah, of course. Yeah, wages are, are growing across the economy. Now, of course, the problem is, and the most is it's not keeping up with where inflation is right now. So the experiences of households aren't necessarily, the, the buying power is less than you would have had two years ago, but the, but the premiums, at least for workers, have gone up. Um, it, does mean less to the uh, household's bottom line uh and we you know the inflation story is a whole other piece that we can get into later this evening. Right. A, whole, a whole other talk i think um lauren i can imagine that the um over at the mass uh, business roundtable there's a lot of discussion about how to retain and attract uh, workers, Mark is talking about sort of this stickiness of, of potential of the, the power that workers now are enjoying. Uh, what are you seeing and are companies adapting? Are they changing to accommodate this new perspective on work? That's a great question. Um, talent has long been a top priority for members of the roundtable. I think during the pandemic, that need 
to find talent, uh, the need to retain talent has continued to be top of mind, has been compounded by the complexities of these new work environments that we're finding ourselves in. Uh, I'm glad that we started the, the discussion though with some stories because at the end of the day, I think what employers are also realizing is there's a human element to all of this. And many of our members have talked about the need to lead with empathy. Um, and I think realize that to be able to retain the talent that they have, as well as to attract new talent, they have to think about um, the needs of the employees that they already have, as well as the needs of potential job seekers that they want to bring into the door. Um, and so recognizing um, there's a whole new element of what it takes to attract and retain talent and even develop talent. Um, I think companies are, are recognizing that's the ways that things were, uh, that the way that things were in, in you know January, February of 2020 or before um, is no longer. And there is certainly power that employees and job seekers have um, in order to um, attract and retain and, and develop that talent. I'd like to bring Leslie Ford in because Leslie, you, as part of your work with Mom's Hierarchy of Needs, have been surveying parents in if anyone was hit hard during this pandemic, it's been parents who had to figure out how to work and take care of kids when daycares and schools closed down. And it's been just such an extraordinary disruption. Uh, 2,000 parents you've been serving since March of 2020. I wonder, are they feeling the benefits of what Lauren is talking about, this more empathetic um, approach to employment? So it's an excellent question. So yes and no, I'll, I'll give you kind of both sides of the answer. At an individual level, employees, workers, and particularly workers who are in historically overlooked groups. Um, my study indexes very heavily on mothers and you know women, people of color, people who have not traditionally been in the leadership roles in my study are still not feeling a great deal of personal power to negotiate a change. So there's a question where we ask, you know, do you feel comfortable asking your manager for what you really need? And only 3% say that they are. Um, that psychological safety still isn't there for historically overlooked groups. However, I think what's changed is the number of and level of options. So instead of having a really awkward discussion with your manager that you really don't want to have and don't think that you're going to win, you can just look for another job. <laughs> and that's what's happening. So if people feel that they cannot effectively set boundaries at work or maintain boundaries at work or navigate politics at work, instead of kind of dealing with it, which they might have done several years ago, or trying to have a protracted negotiation to change it, they say, you know what, um, I can upgrade and this is the perfect time. So that's how I'm seeing that power exercised. And to your point and Lauren's about what's available, more employers than ever are paying attention to family benefits, benefits for caregivers, flexibility in terms of location and even hours. You know, those are parameters that used to be pretty fixed in a lot of professions. And suddenly people feel like they have room to make some different choices, which I think overall is super exciting. When you when you say, you know, these benefits that, that relate to caregiving, are we talking about, you know, daycare provided at the office? Is, does it because that that's a pretty um, I think that was a pretty rare perk um, pre twenty twenty. It's still a pretty rare perk, like like less than ten percent of workers have access to that, like extremely rare. But they've the options are broader now, so more employers. It's still not the majority, but a more significant minority are subsidizing the cost of childcare or daycare. I saw pretty early in the study that for people who were in essential work roles, like people who worked in hospitals, teachers, their employers were taking extra measures to provide them with childcare. 
um, particularly for folks who were in hospitals and medical settings. So employers have always had a little bit of, you know, they've had their toes in the water on care for a long time. A lot of organizations have offered backup child care, recognizing that if your primary care falls through, like your sitter is sick or daycare is closed, that happens frequently enough for parents that providing an alternative was you know, a mutual benefit. But you know, backup care is more than just backup care now, right? In the pandemic, people have lost childcare for months at a time. And although childcare was pretty hard to find, especially affordable childcare, there's now a huge childcare shortage, um, particularly in, in Massachusetts, but also in other places. So employers realize that if they don't take some creative measures to support workers with childcare or elder care, that it doesn't really serve anyone. Because they've got to do their jobs. Lauren, are there any, before we jump back to Mark on the, a larger question of kind of filling the gaps with workers, um, mm -hmm. Lauren, are, you, are there any tangible things that you're seeing employers do um, that they weren't doing 2020 or that they're moving toward doing now? Absolutely. Um, I think just on the heels of the conversation around early child care, um, the Roundtable helped to launch the Massachusetts Business Coalition on Early Childhood Education. And it actually is comprised of about 85 plus employers across the Commonwealth who are coming together to advocate for more accessible child care, more affordable child care. And so while there are some employers that are thinking about what does this mean within my workplace, we also have um, employers using a megaphone to um, really speak to the need that we had statewide and with the state infrastructure um, for um, enhancing early child care services and, and the system. And, and this, the legislature is uh, very much a partner in um, that kind of reform. Um, but I think also you have employers that are talking about as well as walking the walk and implementing new ways of, of working when it comes to mental health in the workplace, when it comes to work-life balance so that the child care as well as elder care or any other kind of self-care um, can be um, recognized and appreciated. So when someone's showing up physically in the office or on a Zoom or a virtual platform, um, people recognize that it's, you know, it's, there's more to it. Um, and there's a recognition um, that, um, you know, they're going to put the work in, they're going to be very productive employees and, and workers, um, but they may also have other responsibilities as long as they are maintaining that high productivity. I think employers are realizing how valuable that is and um, that, that they can also elevate conversations on other needs and benefits that job seekers and, employ and employees need today that they may not have needed before. Um, that's also important. And so I, I would just say, go ahead. I would just say a part of all of this, why employers are realizing the value for this is to maintain competitiveness. It's to maintain competitiveness for the employer and how they're attracting and retaining talent. But I think also, you know, competitiveness here in Massachusetts, because um, if we don't have employers thinking differently and how they're going to attract and retain the talent here in Massachusetts or attract and retain talent in our own backyards for companies that are from the Berkshires to the Cape and in between, um, then there's a threat there as well for where that talent may choose to go because we are increasingly mobile um, in you know, as a result of the pandemic. Right. I mean, it, it, you, you can work anywhere, right? You could be in Boston and work for a company overseas or vice versa. You could live in a cheaper place. Right. And Mark, I think that brings us back to some of your research. I mean, yes, companies can adapt to these new priorities workers have, but there's a finite number of workers. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what the big economic picture is. If you've got so many open jobs and employers cannot fill them, what happens and, and where do we get workers to, to fill those jobs? Or how, how, do, how do employers get those workers at this point? Right. I think in Lauren set that part of the conversation up really well, talking about competitiveness. I think one of the critical things that have been that was forgotten uh, over the course of the pandemic, uh, you know, over the last decade or so uh, longer, 
labor economists have been talking about concerns of labor shortages in the future, particularly as it related to the re impending retirements of the baby boomers. And, and now at this stage, old Gen Xers. I'm a young Gen Xer in my mid forties, but older Gen Xers are folks who are in their uh, mid to late fifties. Uh, and one of the, so the pandemic happens, everybody freaks out, the world stops. But one thing that definitely happened was we kept getting older. Right. So then uh, so one of the things that we're having happen that's uh, overlapping with all the challenges that happened with COVID is that we already had an aging labor force. We had an aging labor force in New England. We have one in Massachusetts and we have one nationally. It's more acute in New England. But what it sets up is this uh, related to Lauren's points is that there is a competitiveness as it relates to a flexible work environment that is created through the future of work. But there's also a competitiveness issue of just simply not having as many workers to fill the roles necessary for an economy to grow. So right now in Massachusetts, we're about 20,000 uh, working age adults uh, below where we were pre-pandemic. We're about 14,000 uh, uh, people in the labor force below where we were pre-pandemic. If you look at the uh, at a line of our workforce size over the last 30 years, it's a, it goes straight up, right? What happens in the pandemic, though, it, it blips down, and then now it's been kind of flat and coming up slower. We should have had a larger labor force. Instead, we have a smaller one now. And the, and the primary concern is that we are, uh, as baby boomers reach retirement ages, as Gen Xers reach retirement ages, do we have enough people coming up the ranks to fill the, the job openings that we need? So it's a short-term problem now, but a long-term problem. So uh, our, my colleagues at Mass Benchmarks, uh, we track, uh, which is the journal that focuses on uh, the Massachusetts economy, uh, we think we're years away from recovering all the jobs lost during the recession. And the reason isn't because the economy isn't growing. It's because you can't fill a job if there isn't a worker there to fill it. And right now, as our age profile shifts a little bit older, we run into this risk of not having enough labor to fill opportunities for growth. Now, uh, a couple other things about the pandemic that were critical uh, one was in this most recent year, 2021, was the first year in Massachusetts history that we had more deaths than we had births. Uh, that is partly a, a function of a pandemic, and it's also a function of an aging population. Secondly, we had a dramatic decline over the last five years in immigrant, uh, in, in net uh, international migration. Uh, Immigrant labor has been central to the story of economic growth in Massachusetts for decades. Since 1990, 80% of the labor force growth in Massachusetts is because of the growth of foreign born labor. But during the Trump administration in particular, with changes in policy and kind of rhetoric around immigration, coupled with a global pandemic that really stopped the flow of people uh, moving from uh, overseas, dramatically impacts Massachusetts economy. So part of what you're raising now is a short term is a relationship between short term and long term issues, because we have a smaller labor force now than we did pre pandemic. And the demographic trends for Massachusetts are such that we are at risk of having a smaller labor, uh, not having enough labor to grow the economy the way we want to going ahead. So being competitive is central. It is having employers that are flexible. Uh, it is uh, being proactive with public policy so that we're building housing. So the quality of life uh, in Massachusetts is, is, is at a high quality. Um, we have some of the highest housing prices in the country. That's been an issue for a long time. Um, uh, and, and, so, and, and it's being able to find labor in places where <clears throat> that have been non-traditional in the past meaning older workers staying in the labor force longer, finding more job sharing opportunities for, for working mothers, uh, helping with folks uh, who were previously incarcerated uh, in increasing their labor force participation. Proactive thinking about uh, workforce development is going to be central to economic growth for Massachusetts over the next 20 to 30 years. Mark, that's fascinating when you're talking about it a shrinking labor pool, which could impact the economy. You're saying that 
we have traditionally relied on immigrants to fill jobs and that population is not what technically the economy needs. Uh, and so it's creating opportunities for other people and that, that other groups of people. And that leads into a, a couple of questions we're getting from the audience. Um, you know, Gail asks, uh, is the uh, big quit also happening with older workers? And here from Maddie, uh, in all of this mess, how are we to think about the workplace as we age um, and missing a generation from the workforce that would help preserve social, social security and other benefits. So there's sort of two things in there, and maybe this is a question for you as well, Mark. Um, you know, is, is an effort being made to retain older workers? And, and what happens, to your point, when we lose all these workers um, to people who are heading into their retirement years and relying on Social Security? Right. So, and again, these were the public policy things we were talking about a decade ago. And they just kind of, they lost steam because for obvious reasons, the pandemic took up a lot of the, the emotional energy in, uh, around public policy. Now, the first question about, are we seeing a big quit with older workers? Yes, we saw an increase uh, uh, in retirement uh, right, right, right near the pandemic. And it makes sense. You had older folks who may be more vulnerable, people who are kind of on the line a little bit about maybe I'll retire, maybe I won't, and maybe and saying, you know what, that's fine. I, 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 I'm worried about my own safety. Uh, working remotely is, is maybe tough for me for whatever reason, and, and these folks uh, pulling out of the labor market in general. In terms of the bigger public policy thing about uh, Social Security, um, this has been uh, what is under, has been underpinning the, the, the debate nationally around social security for the last 20 years or longer of what's going to happen when this uh when this glut of baby boomers move into retirement ages and with uh, uh life expectancy traditionally increasing although the last couple of years we actually had a slight decrease in, in life expectancy um and that's something that we have not adequately uh, uh solved and, and one of the big concerns I have, and it relates a lot to some of the question, uh, some of the childcare issues even before is that COVID, it, pivoting back to COVID was a great revealer of a lot of elements of social inequality. But are we thinking proactively about infrastructure uh, as it relates to supporting families and supporting uh, households in general? That could be a, when we talk about social security and retirement, but it could be other elements of, of infrastructure too when we think about early childhood education or uh, uh, cost of childcare and so on. And I'm a little bit concerned the way the debate has kind of devolved over the last year that we kind of started settling back into same old, same old conversations as opposed to thinking about or remaking uh, and using COVID as, as the impetus for thinking uh, proactively about public policy. I think at the state level, we're thinking in, in a very smart way uh, I get concerned that at the national, we're, we're not. And uh, that could take us in a different direction altogether. But I think those are uh, some of the things that at least percolated in my mind as I listened to the other panelists talk this evening. Yeah, I think that's maybe the hope, the expectation that there will be some real change. Uh, but you talk about existing trends being exacerbated by the pandemic, right? People retiring, having enough younger workers, something that was exacerbated by the pandemic. Leslie, what kind of trends you know, working with parents and working with employers as you have for so long, what kind of trends have you seen exacerbated over the last two years relating to workers and employers? Um, well, it's in, it's been really interesting. So one of the trends that's been exacerbated is just the fact that a lot of employers are not necessarily prepared to handle um, planned, <laughs> planned, let alone unplanned leaves. So you have a lot of people in addition to parents who have been managing some of the ch challenges that I referenced earlier with child care and with elder <clears throat> care you have a lot of people who became accidental caregivers during the pandemic, you know, for themselves, for partners, for, you know, aging family members or not aging family members dealing with long haul COVID. So, you know, navigating the, the challenges of care and integrating that and, and normalizing it within the workforce, I think there's a 
an incredible opportunity to do so. But that trend, how well organizations are prepared for that, how well organizations support parental leaves and returns to work, whether it's from a parental leave or as more organizations I'm seeing are actively developing programs and cultivating return ships to Mark's point about the labor shortage, looking at those workers who might have traditionally been overlooked because they've been out of the labor force for a while, often because of caregiving responsibilities, you know, how to court them and bring them back in. So I see that there's a, it's a more progressive work policies, benefits, Employers are also paying more attention to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I think that is also part of this uh, retention need, right? In a, in a labor shortage scenario where a lot of people are competing for top talent, if you're hiring people who are historically overlooked and they are like revolving out of the door two or three years later, that's an expense for employers. That's um, a challenge for culture. So I'm, I see employers, and again, I think this is very positive because work didn't work for a lot of people before. So they're starting to dig deeper on, you know, who's getting promoted? Why is that person getting promoted? How do we make people feel seen and included and, um, you know, like they are part of the organization? So a lot of those softer, uh, I think aspects that really underpin a strong culture and make workers feel like they want to stay regardless of whether their comp is the highest or not, organizations are paying attention to that in addition to the benefits that we mentioned earlier. And Lauren, are you also seeing, uh, uh, Leslie mentioned, you know, workers who may have left the workforce for child care. We've talked about older workers, recruiting them, getting them back into the workforce. What are there other groups that in this very tight labor market are being courted and that employers are reaching out to in new ways and maybe creating new opportunities for um, because of the labor shortage? I think over the past two years, um, you know, just to connect back to the, the point earlier around um, inequities, I think employers have recognized um, health inequities brought on by the pandemic or ex exasperated by the pandemic. And then also, as Leslie mentioned, um, the call to action from the business community on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I think as a result, employers are being um, more intentional um, growing in their DEI strategies, um, renewing, enhancing, or just getting started in some cases, um, how to best attract um, diverse talent. And to Leslie used a great word, belonging, recognizing that they, I think employers realize it's not just putting out a statement, it's not just saying we need more diversity, but realizing that there's a, a huge strategy that needs to be invested in um, to ensure that there's equity in the workplace, um, that they're the, that all employees feel included, and there's a sense of that belonging in the culture that many of these employers uh, for your um, your office type jobs um, have had to invest in in a two, past two years and very virtual um, um, dynamic. And now with some of those employers bringing employees back in the workplace, with some now also remote or some hybrid, there's an added complexity to how um, this sense of culture in an office, um, physically or virtually, can be um, uh, achieved. And I think making sure that um, groups that may have been um, most vulnerable during this uh, past two years um, feel that sense of belonging um, and I think also for companies that are just getting started on a DEI journey, um, that they have to recognize it is a journey and that um, it takes a lot of investment in time and culture is a huge part of that. Lauren, are you seeing evidence of people really committing to sort of a hybrid culture and being able to build what you're talking about in terms of a, a work culture that is inclusive? I mean, that is a huge challenge, I would think. 
um, to figure out new ways of working and to and to build those bonds when when part of it is virtual or maybe all of it is virtual. Yeah, I know some of our members are, are wrestling with this very topic, thinking about equity and what that means when you have some employees coming in on varying days. Um, you know, there may be a hybrid schedule for a certain team. Um, and there may be uh, differences within even a department. And what does that mean? Or what does that mean where someone may have been in person two years ago and is now totally remote? Um, and how do you send, provide that sense of democratization that employees may have felt in a virtual environment over the past two years? Um, you know, there was a different culture where you're able to um, chat in the Zoom uh, chat or speak up you know, in a, a, a company town hall that was run virtually, how does that continue to translate in a hybrid work environment? How does that continue to translate as employees return to the office? And I just think there's a hyper, um, there's a better sense of awareness and, and value of culture and that employers are trying to ensure that they do it right. Um, and I think we're also mindful or employers are mindful that um, there's a lot of best practices out there of people who um, have done it well before the pandemic and um, learning from um, uh, colleagues uh, within the business community. Because I think with all these changes in the workplace, one thing I've noticed employers realize that um, it's best to to look at what other companies are doing as much as what they're doing as well, because um, we've all had to navigate in so many new norms. Um, and and it's, a, it's valuable to be able to see what's happening, not only within your industry, but across industries, um, as well as across um, sizes of companies too. Um, I want to remind the audience that you can put some uh, questions you may have in the Q&A, and we'll try to get to those. Uh, we've got a number of them coming in. Um, okay, <laughs> this is from Bill. How permanent do panelists think that the new found job benefits, flexibility, higher wages, et cetera, uh, will be? Uh, Mark, you used the word sticky before. Are you confident that um, that these changes are, are here to say that stay, that workers will retain some level um, of power in this equation? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, I think uh, it's a great question. And I think, you know, one of the things that has really stood out throughout the pandemic is just the challenge of being able to predict what was next. You know, when we, when we, uh, step back two years and think about, you know, where we were pre pandemic, but then like what every, you know, four to six months were, I mean, it's, it's been an incredible time period. Really. You think about like the George Floyd murder happens in the middle of 2020. Right. And, and so like, we're barely in the pandemic and then we have this incredible racial reckoning happening at the same time. Then we have the election and everything that's been happening this year, Ukraine and so on. So I think, you know, there are certain elements of this that are that are hard to define the stickiness when you talk about like, well, what is what is the wage? What, what's going to happen with wages going forward? You know, I, simple economics says that if you have uh, a smaller labor supply, uh, then there's just going to be increased demand for that labor. So one would think that that would have positive benefits on wages long term, but capitalism is is a um, is an evolving creature, right? And so how how different how you find different ways to create labor, um, you know, that will be a factor in what we see with wages and so on. In terms of flexibility with workers and in hybrid work. Um, you know, again, I think it's a little bit hard to define what that future looks like. I'd love to, you know, come back in a year or two and see like how this kind of seeps into the DNA of, of work cultures in general. I mean, a year ago at this time, we were 100 percent. Uh, we're, we're walking into a world where cities don't matter anymore and it's going to be 100 percent remote and so on. And, and and I never really bought that. I always felt like the future was probably going to be some sort of hybrid model. And I think that's kind of what we're heading towards. I wouldn't be, I, I think the future looks like a, a three and two in the office or a two and three kind of thing, or employers looking more to be flexible in those ways, but maintaining some on site uh, type of uh, um, presence. So I think that that to me is the part that ends up being sticky. But like, there's a lot of things that can evolve over time with this stuff that I feel like 
it's still too early to tell when we're when we're talking about like what the future of work is in terms of remote or how place changes you know we, we were talking again folks were talking in 2020 about the death of cities and you know I, and i feel like that was wildly overstated but like where are we going to be in 2024 and 2025 those are tougher things to really be able to tell right now but i do think we're in an evolutionary period for sure and i mean i even before pandemic i was i served on the governor's uh, future transportation task force uh, or commission excuse me and we were talking about remote work as as a way of solving the transportation problems in massachusetts and you know i'll admit i kind of rolled my eyes at that and saying like yeah that sounds great but i just don't see us like roundly doing remote work as a as a labor force i think it's the culture isn't there well when the culture gets forced on you <laughs> then things shift right so so I think that's a long winded way of saying, you know, it's hard to know which elements of these things are going to stick going forward. There are some statistical things that will just point to a hey, labor force is going to be smaller and workers have certain things that they expect now as it re relates to flexibility. And I would expect those things to at least stick uh, in the medium term. Yeah, I mean, who could have imagined it? You know, 128 at five o'clock in the afternoon or going through the city on 93 at, at six o'clock, being able to do that without traffic. I mean, it was just, I think what happened yeah. um, over the last two years was really unimaginable uh, before March of 2020. Um, Leslie, maybe you can answer this question from Ed. Uh, in your work as a consultant to companies, uh, your allies at work efforts, um, Ed asks, how have managers changed their working styles to accommodate remote and hybrid? Have you gotten a sense of that in your work? Oh, it's a good question. Um, unfortunately, not all managers have changed their working styles, right? And the working style does need to be different. I think the managers that, that get it and that have been successful with the transition are paying much more attention to being transparent with their communications and being really clear about what they mean, um, being much more, I think, sensitive and empathetic to the mental health crisis that's uh, raging in the background of all of this. I mean, one of the early themes that kind of surfaced in the research study that I conduct is just how, you know, people were besides themselves about their children's mental health and their own mental health. And there's a lack of providers and a lack of good options with this huge crisis raging. So managers that check in on their people, ask about them in the one-on-one -on -one before just kind of diving into the work of the day. Managers that frankly respect people's off time. I mean, we had reached a point in our culture where overwork and working to the point of burnout was glamorized. So, you know, I tell managers, it's like, you know, you might like to work at 10 o'clock at night and that's okay, but your people don't need to know that. You can schedule that email to go during business hours. You know, people are so burned out. They don't want to log back on and monitor email after their you know children have gone to sleep or after they've had dinner. But the culture in the organization has a big impact on that. If the culture is that, you know, 10 people are going to reply all uh, after a manager sends a message at 10 o'clock at night, or a manager reaches out on Slack off hours on the weekend, and that fantastic assignment that everybody wants is being assigned off hours, it's going to persist this culture where people feel like they have to be always on. So I really work closely with organizations to, to create a more inclusive culture, which means like creating an equitable opportunity for people to participate uh, at work and not penalize people who might have caregiving responsibilities that are incredibly demanding outside of work. Uh, it's also tempting with those phones, right? Leslie, it's just so easy to, to send a message on Slack or to send an email. And uh, those are that's some good advice about maybe not doing that, right? In the evenings and in the weekends. Just, on the or weekend. scheduling it. So no one scheduling knows. It. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps that's the solution. Um, interesting question from Joe. Uh, 
maybe this is a good one for Lauren. Um, how have workers who are forced into remote arrangements by COVID responded to new measurements to put in place to keep track of what they're doing? And will this measurement regime last? Uh, I think he's talking about monitoring, right? This is a way that employers, I, I suppose, have tried to keep track of what people are doing when they're not in the office. Um, have you seen this in use, Lauren? And, and do you think it will remain so if, if it is in use? Yeah, and what I've seen is probably not in the details of what our employers are seeing day to day, but um, kind of as a, at a high level, we've heard um, in, in surveying our members during the course of the past two years um, that employers are seeing their employees um, at high rates of productivity. Um, and I think it really is going to be on a case by case basis within the work environment or at you know within a certain company on how that productivity is defined, but there is, um, you know, there, there is satisfactory or even beyond satisfactory um, um, achievement that employers are seeing in these remote times or um, these new work environments. Um, I think some employers also recognize that, you know, because of other responsibilities at the home, you know, work in a remote work environment, what may have been, you know, the nine to five before is not as necessary as long as they're getting the work done. Um, and so if it means that they're clocking in at 10 to six, or they're gonna have to take a break to go pick up their kids, and then they're gonna come back online, if that's what works for them to be productive, um, then, you know, I think some employers are, are thinking that that is okay because they are what they want to make sure that at the end of the day, their employees are productive, the work is getting done, and that they are able to accommodate perhaps a, a new set of uh, needs that employees have in their remote workplace um, that they did not have previously. And to stay Stephanie, flexible. Can I, yeah, Stephanie, can I shoot in there oh, with that too? Absolutely. I think, Please you know, mark, yes. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting to me well, in sitting in this spot, because I mean, you guys asked me to be here because of the uh, economic research, but you, I, you, when you introduced before I have 15 step, I actually have 20. So I'm also an employer, uh, separate from analyzing this, you know, externally from a macro level. And I, I think from my perch, like I've been wonderfully satisfied with where our productivity was. Now we've had a lot of, it's intellectual labor, you can do now. You can analyze data from anywhere on Earth, um, but one of the things for me was um, wanting to afford flexibility to staff. We always had a certain level of it, but we've been able to increase that level of flexibility. And I think even me as the manager, I have two young children. You know, one of the things that have uh, our quality of life actually went up in the pandemic once the stress of the pandemic went away. You know, the ability to, as uh, Lauren was mentioning, to go pick up the kids, to leave a little bit early so that I can take, um, you know, them to a, their lessons or whatever the thing is. And, you know, really instilling that kind of culture within the team that, hey, that's fine. Just get your work done. You know, I, I'm not watching what time you're logged on or what time you log off. It does run into that problem that Leslie highlights where, as a result, some of my emails do come at 10 o'clock, but my team also knows that my kid had a piano lesson on, and so I, I dipped, you know, early so I could take her to her piano lesson. And then now I'm logging back in to catch up on a couple of things I missed while I did that. So, you know, not all work can do this, right? You know, there's service-based work that is a face-to-face -face component. So there is a certain level of a, elitism about the kinds of industries that have that kind of flexibility baked into them. Uh, but, you know, there is a, it, there is a way there's improved quality of life on the other side of that and i think as an employer you know that's one of the things that i wanted to provide that to my staff because i want it for myself and you know recognizing that and sharing that across our team uh and granted and it's only 20 folks right so it's it's easy to kind of easier to build that kind of culture amongst 20 humans than maybe some you know amazon or some giant place like that but you know it's worked really well for us and I think that's, I just, that's sort of the difficulty of this. I'm sorry, somebody had somebody to say. Let's no, I was just going to put an exclamation okay. mark on a point that uh, Mark said. Like, I think we're, we're talking about kind of the office work environment and the changes within that for remote workers or hybrid. But I, I do want to acknowledge a point that Mark said. 
this is not the case for all workers. Um, and when you think about some um, <clears throat> job seekers or workers that are trying to get a job um, or trying to upskill, you know, there's a whole other set of challenges that come with it, especially when they may be juggling childcare, transportation, or other work supports for them to be able to show up for the job or to be able to access and retain a job training program to then be able to be part of um, uh, a, you know, a, a job in the future. And so I just want to recognize that because I know a lot of we've talked about and, and you know, our members are mostly of the, the office or the lab and manufacturing space, but there is a whole other subset, a huge subset of our economy um, that is within the service industry that is also um, for job seekers in the labor market that are trying to, um, you know, access these job opportunities. And it, there are a lot of um, things that they're navigating as well and, and needs that they have too. It is not one size fits all. We unbelievably are at time. I have one last quick question. I guess it's gonna be a yes or a no. Will we at this moment when workers are empowered and are demanding change and work uh, employers need workers, is this the moment we move to a four day work week? What do you think, Mark? So as we did in the warm up, I, I said I was worried that my staff would be watching. So then I would be committed to whatever the answer is. Um, I think that uh, would I don't One think word, maybe. So. No, no, sorry. <laughs> no. OK, Lauren, yes or no? Four day work week ahead. It will depend on the employer. OK, Leslie, yes or no? Four day work week in our futures. Maybe. I don't think it's works for every industry, but I've seen a lot of promising studies about it and other countries have adopted it successfully. We shall see. I think we'll have to reconvene a year from now and see where we're at. Leslie Ford from the Moms Hierarchy of Needs, Lauren Jones from the Massachusetts Business Roundtable, and Mark Melnick from the Donahue Institute at UMass Amherst. Thank you all. Terrific panel, terrific insights. Really appreciate your time. Uh, there is more ahead this evening, but first we have a quick message from our fundraising team. GBH News is a public service and we present it to everyone free of charge. And we do invite you to visit wgbh.org backslash support events to show your support in any amount, or you can simply click on the link in the chat tab and we appreciate you considering that. Um, there is a bonus session in which we will have the opportunity to continue this conversation, hear from members of our audience, hear from some of the people we've profiled that you met earlier on in our discussion. Uh, and the address for that Zoom chat, you may have it in your email if you've already registered, otherwise it is in the chat and you can head over there to share your story. I'd like to leave you with another one of our stories from our series, The Big Quit. This is Alyssa Wilson of Dorchester, who took a big leap of faith to focus on her own business. I'm Stephanie Leiden with GBH News. Thanks again for being here. Have a terrific night. I still feel the anxiety of quitting. It's still on my shoulder. I feel like, man, should I have waited? Could I have waited? What would have happened if I was still at work right now and doing this? Okay, what do I do now? I make crazy soap. I started my business in 2017. I started making soap for myself because I have eczema and my skin gets really dry. And it's finished. So I started doing some research, playing around in the kitchen, but I, I never thought about making it a business. It was just an idea to see if people would actually like what I like. I opened up my shop on Shopify. In the first month I made like $200 and I was so excited to make $200. I told everybody at work, I made $200. It took me like six months to sell like 300 bars of soap. But I've always had my job as my security blanket. I worked at National Grid as a meter service technician for eight years. And I worked overnights. I like my job. The pay was great. I had great benefits. I would do my night shift and I would sleep for like one or two hours and get right back up. 
I can't remember the last time I slept a full eight hours. The pandemic made people more hygiene conscious. They're looking for anything to help them, you know, stab off infection. So our sales literally tripled in one year. I was in shock. I'm like, oh, this is great. Oh crap, I need help. I was so fatigued trying to stay up during the daylight hours to talk to customers and communicate or to even batch for production. Um, I was tearing myself apart with my own schedule. And I, I, it's either I give up my, my job or I give up my brand, so which one? And, and that's what I thought about when I walked into the office. I'm, I'm standing inside the office right now. I'm out of here. I'm not even grabbing my locker. When I quit, I walked into the office and I, I made a TikTok. I just quit my $90,000 job. And I wanted people to see that because there was a lot of people that didn't know I worked. You know, it's been literally like nine days since I quit my job. And I was saying to myself, well, did I make the right decision? I could be making $54 an hour right now. But ever since I quit, I've been able to be more effective at what I do. I like to show people what I'm doing at the moment. I'll show myself packing orders. I'll make a, a video so they see a real person working behind okay. the scenes. I don't know if you all can still hear me. Staying alive. I was worried about speaking, but I think we're okay. <laughs> Thank yes. you all so much. You were Are terrific. Are you ready? Great. Um, I think we're okay. I enjoy to, talking um, to customers and, and continue on with our lives. At the forefront. Perhaps dessert now, Mark. On social. Um, really appreciate <laughs> All your time. I gotta eat. And, um, I want people to feel like <laughs> yeah, they're a part they of the dinner. brand. And they love Hope it. My husband Great to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for shipments. Thank you. It was great to see you. Thank you so much. Have a great night. I'm relying on myself here. Bye, Lauren. Bye, Mark. I have to acclimate my mind. I'm not getting my weekly check. I have to pay for my health insurance on my own now. I will cry when I have to pay my car note next week. But I, it'll be paid. I get anxious, but I feel good about knowing that I'm working towards something. You know, it's only been two months since I quit, but so far so good. Thanks everyone. Have a great okay. night. Please be in touch. I'm sure we'll we'll find you for other things, but uh, reach out anytime. Really appreciate it. Great, I okay. enjoyed it. Bye bye. Thanks. Okay. Good night.